gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this cold, windy Sunday afternoon. My name is Jeff Jerome. I'm a member of the Society to Preserve H.L. Macon's Legacy. I'm here today because we are going to pay a small tribute to H.L. Macon. And many of you joined us the other morning when we were at the Macon House at midnight doing the Macon the, uh, the last hours, and that was certainly exciting. So what we want to do today, and this, this will be short, I'm going to read two tributes to H.L. Mencken, and they are short, and after that we will have a moment of silence, and we'll leave. So if you're ready, I certainly am. This was written by Frederick Rasmussen with the Sun Papers, 2006. It was a typical winter Saturday for author and newspaper man H.L. Mencken, who after eating lunch with brother August, with whom he lived in the old family home at 1524 Holland Street, went to his second floor office, lay down on the sofa, and listened to a radio broadcast of Wagner's Die Meistersinger. In declining health since a 1948 stroke left him unable to read or write, a cruel irony for a man who it is said had written an estimated five million words and more than 100,000 letters during his career. Mencken now passed the time sorting his papers with his secretary, dictating letters and entertaining old friends. Louis Cheslock, a professor at the Peabody Conservatory and a member of the old Saturday Night Club, an a informal musical group organized by Mencken and his friends years before, arrived for a visit and was informed by August that Mencken wasn't feeling well. In her recently published biography, Mencken, the American Iconoclast, author Marion Elizabeth Rogers writes that Mencken came downstairs, walked directly to Cheslock, and shook his hand. He had never done this before. Lewis, this is the last time you'll see me, he said. At these words, Cheslock later said, a chill ran down my back. After drinking two mild Gibson cocktails and enjoying a crackling fire and the lively conversation, Macon again complained of not feeling well, and before going upstairs to his third floor back bedroom, again spoke to Cheslock. Lewis, this is the last time you'll see me. At 9.15, Cheslock left the Holland Street residence and drove home through a gathering sleet storm. Macon climbed into bed, turned on the radio, and fell asleep listening to a Mozart concert. Early Sunday morning, when Rancho Brown, a Johns Hopkins Hospital orderly, arrived to help get Macon bathed and dressed, he was unable to awaken him. His physician reckoned that Macon had died in the wee hours of January 29, 1956. Years earlier, Macon had left written instructions in a small locked metal box in the newspaper's library explaining how he wanted his death reported. He requested only a very brief announcement with no attempt at a biographical sketch, no portrait, and no editorial. As the news wires hummed with the news of the Sage of Baltimore's passing, Sun editors scurrying around the city room ignored Mencken's wishes and readied a front page article announcing his death along with a tribute from Hamilton Owens, editor in chief of the Sun Papers, plus an editorial. On Monday, January 30th, the evening sun weighed in with two stories Private funeral planned for Mencken, and Mencken's death brings tributes from the world, with an accompanying editorial. To discourage the curious, August announced that the funeral, which would be non-religious, would be, would be held at an unnamed mortician's place. 
and that unnamed mortician's place was right down the street from the Mankin house, so they didn't have to go very far for the funeral service. It was held at Witski's funeral home a few doors away at 1532 Holland Street. We'll simply tell them that Harry left instructions there was to be no religious service, but he did want a few old friends around to speed him on his way, August told the Evening Sun. Addressing a small group of mourners, including publisher Alfred A. Knopf, novelist James M. Kane, Lewis and Elise Cheslock, Owen said a few words and it was quickly over. Mencken's remains were placed in a hearse and in the company of his brothers August and Charles. They were taken to Loudon Park Cemetery. His ashes were interred next to his wife, Sarah Hart Mencken, who died in 1935. Fifty years after his death, interest in Macon shows no signs of slowing down. First of all, he is a wonderful writer and no one has been able to write like Macon. He is a genius, said Russell Baker, who began his career on the Sun and later joined the New York Times, from which he retired in 1998. Even though he was, a, he was terrible as a political prognosticator, he was a master of invective and nobody could abuse a man with such eloquence as Mankin. I'm sorry, that, that made me smile. So, I, sorry. Baker said, I had an uncle who wasn't a great reader and lived in the 1500 mm -hmm. block of Holland Street. He used to say of Mankin, he writes those things in the paper that makes people mad, he said. And boy, did he. Baker, who joined the Sun in 1947, recalled an elevator ride with Mankin in the newspaper's old building at Charles and Baltimore Streets. He was a godlike figure. He didn't speak to me, and I didn't dare open my mouth and speak to him, Baker recalled with a laugh. He added, Mankin was a journalist, a literary figure, and a great American humorist who falls somewhere between Mark Twain and James Thurber. When Rogers, who has edited Mankin and Sarah, A Life in Letters, and the impossible H.L. Mankin was writing, uh, uh, let me start it. When Marion Rogers, who, was, who has edited Mankin and Sarah, A Life in Letters, and the impossible H.L. Mankin was writing her present book, author William Manchester, who years ago had written his highly acclaimed Disturber of the Peace, The Life of H.L. Mankin, sent his thoughts on Mankin. And I'll read that in a second. Rogers said she has noticed that more college students are discovering Mencken. Teachers are bringing Mencken into the classroom with more frequency, and this has given him a second lease on life. He's also gaining more popularity in Europe. I think we're beginning to see another Mencken revival, said Marion Rogers. Fred Rasmussen. Baltimore Sun, 2006. Now, the next piece that I'm going to read, much shorter, is from William Manchester. And this pretty much sums it up. Fifty years ago, I spent my mornings reading to an old man who suffered as I now suffer from a series of strokes. He was a writer. He was H.L. Mencken. I have never known a kinder man. But when he unsheathed his typewriter and sharpened its keys, his prose was anything but kind. It was rollicking and it was ferocious. Witty, intellectual, pomacists are a vanishing breed today. Their role has been usurped by television boobs whose IQs measure just below their body temperatures. Some journalism schools even warn their students to shun words that may hurt. But sometimes words should hurt. This is why they are in the language. When terrorists slaughter innocents, when corporate executives betray the trust of shareholders, when lewd priests betray the trust of little children, it is time to mobilize the language and send it into battle. When Macon died in January 1956, he was cremated. That was a mistake. He should have been rolled in malleable gold and polished to blind the cosmos. I shall miss him. America misses him more. 
William Manchester, 1922-2004. So there you have it. And due to the COVID restrictions, we wish we could invite the public to be here. I received uh, many messages wanting to know, can the people come and just stand in the background? And we do have some people here that didn't pay attention when I said, don't show up. They did show up. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the previous event, making the last hours. And I hope you enjoyed this very brief uh, remembrance of H.L. Macon. And maybe next year, this time, you can join these other people in the background and enjoy this moment. So at this time, uh, I would like to have a moment of silence, if you will join me, please. visiting our Facebook page and contributing to the post uh, on that Facebook page. And we are planning a number of special events for 2021, and they will be announced on the Facebook page. Also, we're working on a brand new uh, website. So uh, we'll keep you informed about that. It's going to be exciting and uh, we can't wait till it's up, but it's taking a little bit longer than we anticipated, but it's coming, it's coming. Also, the Macon House is closed, but it is available by appointment only. You can contact us by emailing us at info at makinhouse.org. Now this video will be posted on urge you to like it and if you make any comments please tell us where you are from we would greatly appreciate that so at this moment uh, I, I hope you enjoy the flowers that we got for Macon and we will see you again at the next special event thank you again and have a great day